Hey everyone, Kevin here. It is May 15th and the Federal Reserve just within like the last hour, I mean hot off the press here, released this financial stability report and some of the things in it, I actually sat here and read it and highlighted the good stuff, so I'm just gonna give you the bottom lines. Some of the things in this year report, see it says financial stability report, are not that good. In fact, honestly, they should have hired me to proofread this because I could have fixed that. There we go. All right, now it's better. So. I'm gonna go through this page by page and we're gonna get to the bottom line of what's going on in terms of what the Fed thinks is happening. There are four methods that the Fed uses to kind of evaluate what's going on. So what I'm about to read you are the four methods. So here you go. The first thing they look for is something they call valuation pressures. Basically, the more pressure there is on prices, the more likely they are to fall, right? So they're trying to figure out, all right, how much pressure is in the pressure cooker. How likely is the balloon to pop? The bubble to burst. Okay, then they look for excessive borrowing by businesses and households. And then they look for leverage within the banking sector, basically. And then they look at uh, funding risks like credit markets and things like that. I, a lot of this stuff is so hard and boring to read. I, I tell you, I did not get to level 99 coffee drinker by reading <laughs> Goosebumps, okay? Although I much preferred reading Goosebumps. <laughs> okay, let's move on to some of the actual findings right here because right now, th this is just kind of what they're looking for. Well, here we get to uh, their first finding. Their first finding on asset valuations, and then we'll go into detail on each of these because this here, just so you know, is the overview. So let's hit the overview and then we'll go in deep. But let's just read the highlighted stuff because that's the juicy stuff, okay? Asset valuations. Asset prices have been volatile around many markets. In fact, if you Google something called VIX, V-I-X, you'll get what's known as a volatility index. It tells you how many people are all of a sudden buying and selling relative to a different day. And as you can see right here, if we kind of zoom in, you get this insane volatility right around March 16th. You get this peak volatility and the bottom of our last market crash here in March was actually March 23rd right here. So you kind of almost see it happen like a ton of volatility right before prices go down substantially. And so it's, it's a really interesting chart to follow. And in fact, if I max out over here, you can see the last time we had a really fat peak was over here. Last peak was over there on October 24th, 2000. 2008 for this volatility index. So this is something really interesting to keep in mind when you're looking at stocks or investments or whatever. But the Fed also looks at this. And so they've been tracking this volatility problem. And they noticed obviously lows in late March and early April. Our second bottom was April 3rd, in case you're wondering, March 23rd, April 3rd. For most companies, that's where you'll see the bottom. Uh, risky, and, and this is what they're finding now. Risky asset prices have risen and spreads have narrowed in key markets. Basically, the crappy stuff that is not so high quality is getting expensive really fast. Usually, when they talk about spreads, what they mean is the spread between risky and safe things. Think about it like this. If the US government borrowed $100 from you, that is you gave the US government $100, and you're like, oh, I hope they pay me back, the odds are they're gonna pay you back, right? So you're not gonna charge them as much interest. Let's say you're gonna charge the US government, I don't know, 1% interest. Well, let's now say, you know, uh, Venezuela comes up to you and says, hey, Kevin, can I borrow $100 from you? You're like, yeah, I'll lend you 100 bucks, but for you, I'm gonna have to charge you 9% interest because I just don't trust your currency as much. This is nothing against people. This is about money. It just has to do with money. Well, that spread is the difference, right? You're charging the US government 1%, charging Venezuela 9%, that spread is pretty big, it's 8%. Well, when the Fed says that spread narrows, that means people are more willing to jump into risky assets. Like, oh yeah, 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 Venezuela, I'll give you 9%. Hey, you know what, I'll do it for 8%. Hey, you know what, I'll do it for 6%. <laughs> and, and that's sort of when you get these spreads converging, which is kind of a sign that people are becoming more comfortable with risk again. And that's what the Fed is starting to notice. But let's see what they have to say about that. What they have to say for themselves. Well, let's pull that sheet right back up and we'll see here that they say, 
asset prices, aka stocks and real estate, remain vulnerable to significant price declines should the pandemic take an unexpected course. In other words, because prices have already gone up and people have already started getting into risky things again, the economic fallout could prove more adverse or financial system strains could re-emerge. Yikes, I mean, that's pretty blunt for the Fed to say that. And remember, this is current. They just released this today, the afternoon. Uh, well, <laughs> of course, after the stock market closed, they released it on uh, May 15th. So it's like, ah, <laughs> that's not that, that's not exciting, okay? Especially since I've literally been plowing money into stocks and into real estate, okay? Maybe I'm the loser they're trying to talk to. At least I'm reading their report. Does that mean I'm gonna sell? Probably not, but <laughs> let's keep reading. Maybe I'm the idiot. Now, in terms of debt, they say that businesses had high debt relative to GDP, gross domestic product, before this crisis crisis, but households didn't have that much debt. They didn't have as much debt as businesses. But the problem that households face is the fact that now people are losing their jobs. It's probably going to be harder for some people to actually repay their obligations. So that's another risk factor because what happens when people can't pay their loans? Well, the financial sector, AKA banking gets screwed. Now they do say to date, Banks have been able to meet surging demand for draws on credit lines. Remember, I always advocate having credit lines and in a crisis, you pull those credit lines so that the banks don't freeze them, okay? You don't want your credit lines frozen. That's how you start building wealth, okay? We talk about it in the money course a lot. Talk about it in the real estate investing course, link below, coupon down there for you as well. Okay, back to this. The Fed also says that banks have been able to build loan loss reserves to be able to absorb higher defaults. This is really good. That is what they're saying here is banks are kind of doing something called like kitchen sinking where they kind of start throwing in a bunch of losses into their expectations for the future. In fact, what I'm going to show you here is a Chase earnings report. It's their current report over here. And it just kind of gives you an example of what they're looking at. See, they write things like this into their earnings report. They say the provision for credit losses was 8.3 billion, up 6.8 billion for the prior year driven by a the deterioration in the markets. And this is just for the JP Morgan section. They have a bunch of other losses indicated in other sections as well, like commercial banking, they have more losses indicated. And so basically banks are trying to prepare and get ready for big losses in the credit marks, the markets coming. And the Fed's saying like, we see that happening, that's good. But depending on how many people actually don't get their jobs back, it could end up becoming bad. They do say that so far, the funding risk has proven less fragile than during the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. That is in 2007, 2009, banks are like, uh-uh, uh-uh, not lending at all anymore, we're done. Now, during this pandemic, they're kind of like, mm, okay, we're just gonna lend to people with like 650 credit scores instead of 620 credit scores. They're like a modest tightening. It's kind of like they they went and didn't like untie their shoe to retie it, they just kind of like, pulled it a little tighter. <laughs> That's kind of all they've done here. So overall, the scariest thing here is actually probably the thing that affects us the most. Notice like in the financial sector, they're not that worried. In the funding sector, they're not that worried. And they didn't really say anything about business debt. Instead, they, what, what the Fed is worried about is the consumer. Our ability to repay our obligations, plus uh, over here, asset valuations. That if this basically pandemic goes the wrong way or goes in an unexpected course, the economic fallout could prove more adverse. Yikes. Okay, you ready for the detail on asset prices like real estate and stocks now? Let's get into some more of the detail right here. Here we go. Okay, an improvement in the asset markets since their troughs reflects expectations for a rebound in market activity. Okay, AKA everything hit the, the fan, so to speak. And now we're like, okay, okay. We're willing to take on risk. We're willing to get back in. All right, well, what's gonna happen? Well, over here we see in terms of property prices, the Fed says, hey, just a heads up, in terms of commercial real estate, farmland and residential real estate, generally these take more time to respond to sudden changes in economic activity, but appear likely to come under pressure. 
That's a big red flag right there. The Fed's going, yo, hey, yo, real estate investors. Yo, Kevin, we know you got a really good course on real estate. Just a heads up, man. You better get some really good wedge deals, okay? Because you might be coming under pressure. And that's where I go. It's all good. <laughs> I got good wedges. <laughs> okay, okay. Continuing on. Uh, here on stocks, look at this. Suggesting it, it, uncertainty remains high and markets remain volatile relative to their historic norms, suggesting the possibility of further Further price declines should developments prove to be more adverse. That's kind of what they had in the summary up front. Price declines could be especially pronounced in areas where valuations have remained high and where asset values are sensitive to the pace of the economy. Now that phrase is pretty specific to commercial real estate, in my opinion. Obviously other things, certain stocks uh, could be heavily affected here as well, but the big one they point to is commercial real estate. And that makes sense because they kind of start bagging on commercial real estate a bit more. But let's just keep reading and order the pages they have. Here we have, however, prices in, in the stock market relative to earnings forecasts have risen since late March to levels seen before the outbreak. So they're saying in certain stocks, they're kind of as expensive as they were before the outbreak, which is kind of crazy. Here we go. Here's where they slam commercial more. Let me just read you this line. Prices of commercial real estate and farmland were highly elevated relative to their income streams on the eve of the pandemic, suggesting that their prices could fall notably. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, that's not good. This is exactly why I actually bought, uh, and maybe I just shouldn't have it all, but I actually bought shares in this real estate investment uh, trust called Simon Property Group at about 33% off of their previous valuation. In my opinion, that is an oversold position. Uh, I, uh, that is, this is speculative though, okay? This represents like less than probably 9% of my portfolio. So don't go run SPG with all of your money, okay? Don't dump all of your money into this. But SPG is something that focuses more on, and, and I know this is gonna sound like cringe to some of y'all, uh, premium outlet malls, malls, I, like I get it. That's not the sector you wanna be in. Obviously, you'll want to be in like Zoom and things like that. But if you're looking for value, in my opinion, there's a potential value play there. I mean, who knows? It's discounted over 67%. Uh, you know, they haven't cut their dividend yet. I'm expecting it to get cut. I'm not so worried about that. But it'll be interesting. This, to me, is my vaccine recovery play, personally, because they've gotten slapped hard. And that's the interesting thing is real estate investment trusts will move with the market like right away. Whereas actual like underlying real estate prices tend to take a lot longer. So you see that reaction right away in REITs where you don't necessarily see it as fast in real estate. You kind of have to wait for rents to fall, people stop making their payments, then the cash flows get reconciled. It's like, oh crap, we got less money. Yo, maybe we should cut the dividend. Maybe that 15% dividend is a little bit too high. In fact, let's take a peek really quick at what it is. Let's just type into Google here, SPG stock. Let's see what the dividend yield is together. Right now, the dividend yield and a at a price of $50.32 or $51.32, it's showing up with a dividend yield of 16.37%. That's, that's not happening. That's not lasting, but look at it. Over the last uh, uh, five years here, and, and don't worry, this is not the only thing I looked at. I didn't only look back at what the price was, but I, I look at the actual underlying assets and the properties that they've acquired, and I know a lot of these malls. You can look it up, but it's all public. But these folks, they're, these, they're selling for 2009 prices over here. Crazy, which maybe you think that's reasonable. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not trying to pitch them. Let's talk more about what the Fed is saying here. So commercial real estate may undergo a substantial repricing in response to disruptions generated by the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, since late February, the hospitality and retail sectors have experienced precipitous declines in demand because of social distancing, putting the ability of these sectors to make timely mortgage and rental payments into question. Totally true. And that's exactly that kind of plummet we've seen in SPG. And what they're saying is this is what is to come for actual real estate, uh, sort of commercial real estate underlying property values. Kind of scary to, to see the Fed say these things. I mean, uh, th th this is definitely not a good feeling stability report. <laughs> uh, then we've got housing prices were somewhat elevated relative to rents before COVID-19. That's interesting. 
House prices have grown at a moderate pace for the past several quarters, and nationwide, prices appear only a little above their long-run average relationship with property rents. However, housing price-to-rent ratios vary significantly across regional markets. Basically, what they're saying is they haven't really noticed a change in real estate pricing yet, and pricing in real estate has been slightly higher than some norms that we've seen in the past, but not dramatically high. In fact, right here, they suggest that here's the growth of prices of existing homes. This is not inflation adjusted, but it kind of shows you that if I kind of draw a line over here, we get, this is probably about 4% right here. 4% growth is where that red line is. And you can kind of see real estate has been somewhere between this 4 and 5% line uh, for really the last 10 years in annual growth. You had this sort of almost 10% spike over here in 11, 12, uh, in the 13 area. And then kind of this, this nice uh, growth over here of around 45 to 5%, which is good. But yeah, I mean, is it possible that real estate prices are going to decline? Possibly. We know that we have mortgage forbearance, but let's see what uh, the Fed's saying about this because they talk about exactly this. So let's jump forward because I'll tell you, there are a lot of pages to read here and I just want to give you the bottom lines. That's where you can see the Federal Reserve says that mortgage borrowing poses less risk to the financial system than in the 2000s. Through the end of 2019, new mortgage extensions remained skewed towards prime borrowers and widespread forbearance measures could help dampen the effect on COVID-19 delinquencies, which were at low levels at uh, the end of 2019. They also said few borrowers had negative equity and that the pandemic, however, might put downward pressure onto housing prices. The ratio of outstanding mortgage debt to home values at the end of 19 was at the level seen in the relatively calm housing market of the late 90s. So that's actually good. And they say here that higher levels of home equity, that's the net worth essentially people have in their homes, generally reduce the likelihood of borrower defaults. However, they do go on to say that some households do struggle with keeping up with debt payments. So the prime borrowers sort of in real estate are kind of okay. But where the problems are in, are basically in households where you have mainly student loan debt, auto loans, and credit card debt. In fact, I found these charts very interesting. Take a look at this. Prime borrowers borrowed the most amount of car debt. So they took on the largest loans. But if you go over to auto delinquency rates, the delinquency rate for prime borrowers was next to 0%. But for subprime borrowers, people with lower credit scores, like under 650, they had uh, delinquencies over here in the range of 10 to 12%. That's substantially higher. And you see the same exact thing in credit card delinquencies. Look at this. You see that people with higher credit scores took on substantially more debt. But when you go delinquencies, they had substantially fewer delinquencies. And this is really interesting when you compare it to real estate, because what they're saying is in real estate, most of the people buying real estate right now are highly qualified. That is, they're mostly prime borrowers. We're not really seeing those uh, subprime loans that we used to see, those ninja, no income, no job, no asset loans. So this to me is, is just fascinating insight into what the Fed thinks is actually happening in the market. And so I'm about to show you one of the bangers of this report. But before I do, I have to remind you to make sure to get your life insurance because this might be stress inducing. <laughs> get your life insurance. It takes you three to four minutes to do it on your phone. Some say up to five minutes, you Apple pay for it. Super easy to do. I've got it, Lauren's got it. Make sure you get your two free stocks with Weeble. It's so funny. Like I look back at some of my old videos from like May 9th and in the videos I'm like, you know, Weeble says that promotion to get two free stocks when you deposit $100 is gonna expire, but they've said that before. I don't see it happening. And then it expired for like a day. And the next day I got an email from them going, Kevin, um, just a heads up, I guess that promotion was really popular and, and we're bringing it back. People really like the platform and they like their two free stocks. I'm like, uh, it's kind of what I figured you'd say. <laughs> so whatever, uh, link down below for that. Okay, let's get to the banger here in this Fed report because ay ay ay, and then I'll try to make a conclusion on all of this, okay? But golly, this is, uh, this is overwhelming. Okay, borrowing by businesses and households, here we go. While household debt vulnerabilities were generally modest before the pandemic, the severity of the shock 
and the associated sudden increase in unemployment and sharp decline in incomes may lead to a significant rise in delinquencies and defaults on household debt. That's bad. When the Federal Reserve comes out and says we might see significant increases in delinquencies and defaults, that is a not a good sign for the rest of what's happening in the market. If anything, this is literally the Fed in a, how many pages is this? This is a 68 page report <laughs> telling you all, yo, <laughs> we got 68 pages just to tell you, yo, Congress, we need some more stimulus because it, the banks are okay. We got them handled. The credit markets, we got them handled. We're worried about household debt and the consumers. How many more different ways do you want us to tell you, okay? You want another report? We'll have another report for you next week, okay? Or maybe we'll do a speech again. Anyway, in regards to my opinion on this, look, I'm that long-term train America person. I teach you my strategies in my money program in the course link below my investing strategies. My POV is I want to build the biggest, fattest treasure chest ever and have the most assets in it and the most wealth building over time. So I just keep dumping assets into this. Is that going to go for a ride potentially with prices going down and up again? Maybe. But because I'm such a big fan of figuring out how to buy things below market value, I feel more comfortable. I try to take on as little debt as possible. My debt ratios are very, very low relative to what could be or what might sometimes be industry standard. Uh, that's one of my big safety nets, I say. But anyway, there you have my opinion, well, my short opinion on what I'm doing in response to this. But I will say that does make me nervous. That does not make me feel good <laughs> about having bought stocks today, okay? But I did feel good about using Weeble, and <laughs> you should too. Thanks so much for watching, folks. We will see you soon.